David Abdullah. Very good morning to you, brother. How are you? I'm very well, thanks, brother. And um, morning to all of your many listeners this morning. And, um, you know, very happy birthday to, to Leroy as well. Yeah. I'm seeing it. So I'm last year, actually, at his birthday mm. um, concert, so I'm celebrating his mm. birthday last year. And, of course, you know, I'm happy 41st Republic Day yes. anniversary to Trinidad and Tobago. I saw couple of people I know getting national awards. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to say a special congratulations to Foladi Motuto who mm -hmm. got um, the award for, for women in development. And there were a number of other people I know, public servants and, yes. and others. Um, um, Calypso Rose, I think mm -hmm. very well deserved. Professor Courtney Bartholomew yep. who has toiled in the vineyards for very many years in the field of medicine and pioneering work as well. Also mm. very well deserved, and and, and Bungie was up there too. Yes, and mm. and our four by four um, gold medal yes. winners at the the world championship mm. a couple of weeks ago. They 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 got uh, a Shikonia gold, I think it was, and and of course they brought honor and glory not just to themselves but to our country, Trinidad and Tobago. So recognition is well deserved. There are a number of others. Um, I can't remember all the names. I am always head, encouraged. I'm always yeah. encouraged when fe people who are uh, hitherto not in the public domain get the award because it says to everybody that we all have a part that we are playing. And somebody's looking. Yes, and the young man who um, helped someone who was um, mm. you know, being, being attacked, um, I think he got killed in the process. Mm. And, and he's being awarded posthumously, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. you know, he demonstrated for a young man tremendous mm -hmm. presence of mind and also, you know, uh, demonstrated what a good citizen is, somebody who helps others who are in distress, even to the point where he himself, unfortunately, tragically lost his life. It's currently four minutes after 11 o'clock. And uh, David Abdullah is here with me. Is that a secret? No, no, it, it is not. You just, you <laughs> just you mentioned it at you, the start yeah. of your program. <laughs> I think I did, didn't I? Well, so much for that secret. <laughs> well, no, that's all right. That's all right. It's, Remember it's, it's not, not to, do I, not tell Bishop a secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I went across uh, together with a number of trade unionists. You um, went across. You went across to Venezuela. Yes, I was uh, across mm -hmm. there last Saturday mm -hmm. and Sunday. Mm -hmm. There was an international conference um, in solidarity with Venezuela. Okay. And um, you know, very mm -hmm. interesting developments happening there. In fact, President Maduro announced something. I saw Christiana Amanpour interview um, mm. the president of Chile, yes. um, Michelle Bachelet, um, a few days ago on her program uh, outside the UN, because of course the UN General Assembly is taking place. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Yes, and and um, President of Chile was saying, well, that's good news about Venezuela because there's there's a there's talks that are starting up in Dominican Republic. Well, we heard that news um, last weekend when President Maduro did indicate mm -hmm. that. Um, the government, because the government has always been committed to, to dialogue. And in fact, President Maduro said that he talks with the opposition all the time, but they don't admit that they talk with him. So that there have been, you know, um, discussions and some dialogue taking place and sometimes agreements and then the opposition breaks the agreement and so on. Mm. Um, but mm. but um, President Maduro did indicate last week Sunday when we had a session with him for several hours in uh, Sunday uh, morning into the afternoon that the... Um, President of Dom Dominican Republic is facilitating a dialogue between the government and the opposition. And there are four governments that are represented in the talks, um, perhaps as referees, I'm not sure what the right word is. But two, two of those governments, of course, are very close to the opposition or closer to the opposition than they are to the government, and mm. two of the governments are closer to the government than they are to the opposition. Like a mediating so force. That's right. Yes. So you mm -hmm. have the Dominican Republic in the middle, mm -hmm. and then you have mm -hmm. Chile and Mexico um, on there and, and Nicaragua and Bolivia as well. Mm -hmm. So so those five governments now are going to try to mediate that conflict. In the same way in that, you know, we have to give credit where credit is due that the the guerrilla war that was taking place between the mm -hmm. um, guerrilla movement FARC and also the other guerrilla movement, the um, e e ELN, I think it is, in, in Colombia, in Colombia yes. mm -hmm. and the Colombia government, those peace mm -hmm. talks were brokered by President Chavez initially and President Maduro. And it's interesting of the results because Cuba. FARC has now joined uh, the civilian um, electoral process, That's right. giving up their guns. So there is nothing That's that right. is too difficult if you have dialogue. That's right. And, and Cuba was a government where the talks were taking place, and Cuba <laughs> played a key role. <laughs> Irony. And, and a few days ago, we actually had World Peace Day, so it's yes. important that yes. there's, there's peace. And there are going to be elections in mm -hmm. Venezuela in a couple of weeks' time. I mean, they say that the, the, the these are local the elections. These, these are, are elections for the, for the governors of the 23 for the governors states. Of the 
which is which mm-hmm. major and then next mm-hmm. year there'll be municipal elections, yes. municipality election for the municipalities and then the presidential elections and mm-hmm. so you know people say that Maduro is a dictator but actually there there'll be more elections in Venezuela than any other country is it true to say that these elections however have been fair yes they're being I mean the Carter um, foundation which as you know Jimmy has, Carter's foundation, yes, yeah. has mm-hmm. operated um, as a kind of internationally respected watchdog All over the world, on, yes. on elections mm-hmm. and other things. Have mm-hmm. been to Venezuela, um, you know, some years ago, and did certify the elections as being free and, and fair. So, in, 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 with that statement, um, and, and, and we we, we got to get to better train. Yes, guys. I know that. But, 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 but with that statement, <laughs> however, is it true to say that we are being fed? propaganda because mainstream reports coming out all point to two things upheaval mass demonstration and oppression on behalf of the maduro government now is it that we are getting twisted news filtered news or is it or is there some truth in what we are hearing it it certainly has been one-sided news in the sense that um the demonstrations and protests have been largely confined Mm -hmm. to certain areas of Caracas. Mm. It was not widespread throughout the country, was not um, widespread in Caracas itself. Uh, there is The reality is that Venezuela is in a difficult economic situation. Um, there's no doubting that. Is the reality what we see, that people are starving or to, to, to the point of or, or almost for, for survival, or is this I think I think that is an extreme description of the situation. Um, there's mm-hmm. no doubt that, that there are shortages um, and so on partly caused by the falling oil prices and the difficulty to import, partly also caused by the mm-hmm. large business people who commercial interests who traditionally import items mm-hmm. and who therefore in trying to squeeze the government and make things ungovernable, quote unquote, have, have also, you know, stopped importing and their problems are falling. So there, there, there are real problems, but there's also um, an agenda by the opposition forces to, to make the situation worse we'll than it than it should be. We'll see how yeah. that plays so, out. But mm-hmm. we hope that these um, discussions between the government and the opposition that are taking place in the DR um, work work itself to a satisfactory end. David Abdullah is the voice you're hearing, leader of the Movement for Social Justice in Trinidad and Tobago, and a former executive with the Oilfield Workers Trade Union, Petro Triton. You know I can't yes. get you without <laughs> that. So, comrade, it's good to have you here. There are some yes. questions I have for you. Yes. The current preliminary finding results of an internal audit was repeated by the opposition leader, Mrs. Fassad Bessessar. Uh, that uh, allegation uh, against a and B oil and gas company owned by Hanif Nazim Basque has received over uh, $80 million, it is claimed, for ghost gas. Now, Petrotrain subsequently held rush meetings and finalized the report. They have passed it on to the line minister. But what we heard from the opposition leader at the time was result of a preliminary um, report. The question is, looking at this as objectively as we can, I think I have to consider what ENV said yesterday. They said yesterday that the problem with this so-called fake oil may be at Petrotrin's measuring standards and techniques and not with the AV company. Is that at all (laughs) possible? Yes and no. Um, so let me say that the issue is not a new issue um, in general terms. Uh, when the whole process of farming out and leasing out oil fields began 20 odd years ago, mm-hmm. the union always raised concerns because of the way in which um, the, the, the process was, was implemented. Where you had, for example, and, and the problems of, were multifaceted. You had people who were working in Petrotrain, um, who then, or his predecessor companies, who then left the company and went to either start up on one of these lease operator companies or went to work with one of the companies and worked with a lot of data and information. Uh, And you mm -hmm. also had a situation where um, oil production declined in Petrotrain's own wells to a point which the company claimed was uneconomic, you know, five, eight barrels of oil a day and so on. Mm. But had there been proper working, uh, you know, servicing of those wells, the production could have been higher. So the, we, the union felt that, that um, the wells were deliberately being left to run down, then making the case for them to be given out to, to other operators. Mm-hmm. The other operators would come in 
and then miraculously within weeks or months the production moved from eight ba the barrels a day to 50 and 100 barrels a day mm. and, and of course the lease operator would then make a significant amount of money um so there is a lot of collusion historically between persons within petrotrain at different levels of the company um and mm -hmm. these private individuals who operate the, the lease out and farm out to the point where in the early days i recall a specific case um where guys because they used to work with the company knew all of the lines and because they had tanks that were shared tanks mm -hmm. um, what happened mm -hmm. was that oil came was run from the petrotrain tank into the private operator's tank oh, fiscalized mm. there in other words measured there as oil produced by the by the lease out operator and then pumped back into the petrotrain tank. Now let us make sure we understand so, that fine language. The oil was stolen from petrotrain, put <laughs> into barrels by independent operators and, and sold to petrotrain. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. You're not known for being that nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. David yeah, Abdullah. In, in effect, it was stealing. In effect, it was stealing. David yeah. Abdullah is my guest this yeah. morning. We're talking about the situation at petrotrain, specifically with their measuring standards. I got a question yeah. for you. Well, production recording, dipstick tests, and sales tank integrity checks should ensure accountability. It leads me to the question, is this oil leak spurious? Oil leak coming from e &V. let us tell you what I'm talking about. e &V say that there's a possibility that some of the, the oil was lost along the way. And I am asking my guests, with all these measures, i.e., the uh, production recording, dipstick test, and the sales tank integrity before Petrotrin actually gets it. Uh, is yeah. this possible? Well, I'll tell you, because I was talking to some of the guys in the union yesterday, actually. And, um, you know, you, you see, it's supposed to be measured at different points along the way. One is at the point where it leaves AV's tanks mm -hmm. or whoever the lease operator is and then goes into Petrotrin's tanks. Petrotrin then pumps that from a main <laughs> storage area in Forest Reserve up to Point of Pear. Okay. And there's supposed to be recordings of how much oil is pumped um, for the day. Mm. So it's supposed to be every day you say we pumped mm. 5,000 barrels of oil. Point of Pear now is supposed to be able to also record how much oil it receives yes. from Forest Reserve. Mm -hmm. um, and they just therefore mm. supposed to say we got 5,000 barrels of oil. Um, now, in some cases, there's a certain amount of water as well mixed in, but let's assume for argument's sake, it's 5,000 barrels. Point of Pear was recording less oil over a considerable period of time mm -hmm. than um, Forest Reserve was reporting as having been pumped. Point of Pear, what should have happened immediately, mm -hmm. investigation should have taken place. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that Point of Pear itself was not sure, Petrotrain as a whole was not sure, whether it was as a result of possible leakages or if it was a result of something else. I can understand that if it's about but $5 million. I can understand if over a short period of time, because this audit worked for a, over a short period of time. So if you're telling me that there was negligence or somebody didn't follow through or somebody uh, probably thought sedimentation, whatever argument you want to put, something happened in the middle of the day, I'll say okay. But you're talking about a lot a of oil here. Yes. And yep. to tell me that you've got the means of finding out because it is sent to you at Petrotrin, and you did not realize it. And for a company to tell me that what we are putting out, we are being paid way in excess of what we put putting out, and we did not realize it. I am yeah. looking at, um, what is the word? A fish market from both sides. Yeah, it, it, yes, and, and this is what I'm saying. There's collusion at different levels within mm -hmm. and outside. Yes. So you have a situation where, and I'm speaking about AV specifically now, where oil may be coming into the tank farm, say, in, in Forest Reserve, mm -hmm. right? And they, it's supposed to be 5,000. Let's use 5,000 easy mm -hmm. figure. Mm -hmm. And of that 5,000, um, 3,000 is supposed to be Petrotrin zone oil that it produced, and 2,000 is supposed to be oil from lease out, several lease out operators and farm out operators. Right. You then get a situation now where um, Petrotrin claims its production has not fallen, yes, same 3,000. So 3,000 is there. Right. Mm -hmm. But the total amount that goes up to point of pair is 5,000. Mm -hmm. Yes. But the lease out operators are claiming they now produce 2,500. Uh -huh. So it therefore implies that Petrotrain's production would have fallen by 500 barrels. Or somebody's lying. Or somebody's lying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So there seems, to be a l mm -hmm. there seems to be a lot of problems in this, which is why the union does not like the system 
because there are too many avenues for corruption to be taking place are at these, different levels. Are the measurement so standards, David Abdullah, at Petrotrin up to date? Now, you said the unions have been complaining about it, but let us talk about the actual standards they have for measuring. Are the standards at Petrotrin up to date? Uh, which is to say consistent with those used by other oil-producing nations, you know, where oil Companies, controls a yeah. magnificent percentage and of their GDP. Yeah, I, I, I was asked that question yesterday to find out exactly in all of the areas what um, methods they use, whether it is, um, you know, electronic measures or whether it is it is dipping a tank and so on with a, with a stick, um, which which can be mm -hmm. used as a measure. You just simply, once you get your, your level, you know the, the volume of the tank, you just make a calculation as to how much oil is inside mm -hmm. it. And mm -hmm. you might be out by a few barrels, but you're not going to be out by, by a thousand barrels or yes. two thousand barrels. Yes. Or that kind of thing. Yes. So um, the, the, the issue in my mind is not so much the measurement standards, but it is the, it is the systems that ensure mm. Compliance. Compliance mm -hmm. and that nobody is falsifying data and information at whatever, at whatever um, point and so on. Because if we're talking about corruption, this is, this is big money. <laughs> this is big money. That's right. This is big money. And um, that is why I'm concerned that in big money, which folks are talking to me about a trust system. I want you to explain to me that trust system <laughs> well, no, that you exists. Can't, you can't have trust in this matter. Well, precisely you, my you point. This is not a matter of trust. This is not the left hand and the right hand, you know, taking money out of your left pocket and putting exactly. it into your right pocket. It's not the same. This is a raping same a, a whole nation That's right. and, and taking out. So this right. trust system I'm hearing, does that still obtain? I'm, I'm not sure about that, but it certainly ought not to obtain. And let me just make the point, you know, that um, as leader of MSJ, I had called for the appointment of a special prosecutor to investigate corruption, mm. um, past and present, whether it is ferry, whether it is AV oil, whether it is um, other matters, whether it is matters relating to what happened in the last government with Deetham Wastewater, all kind of projects and so on that we heard about. Um, things with EMBD and land and HEC, all of those things. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, we need to have a, a special prosecutor, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. happened, for example, when Ramesh Miraj was Attorney General and Carl Hudson Phillips was, a, was appointed special prosecutor, and you had um, Bob Lindquist as the forensic auditor who could follow the money, mm -hmm. track the money, mm -hmm. and so on. We need uh, that kind of resource to be able to deal with corruption. Because this, the, f the ferry um, story, and I was listening to your, you were talking mm -hmm. to, to Rishi a while ago. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, what is going to be the outcome yeah. of that GSC? What was the outcome of the Mute report? Mm -hmm. Information, but information not leading to prosecution of persons who may have been involved in wrongdoing is really just back on our Since you went there, do you feel a, a, a particular resolve in that area just real quickly? Do you feel a, a resolve in seeing a report coming out of the GSC coming to real prosecution where necessary? Do you I, feel that? I don't think there'll be there'll be a report, but I don't think that it will lead to prosecution. All right, let me go back to Petro Trend. <coughs> <coughs> so much so much for my optimism. <laughs> Thank you, comrade. I needed I needed I needed that dash of water on top of this. Uh, David Abdullah, uh, the leader of the MSJ, is my guest this morning. While the complaint is that Petro Trend lacks the managerial expertise to properly lead the company, it is argued by the union that too much money is paid to management. Folks, however, have proffered that getting the right management personnel requires salaries compatible with what is paid internationally. How do you reconcile these different perspectives? The, the first thing that we need to have is a board that is appointed. You have to start at the top. Um, and, and so the, the executive management is hired by, by the board. So if the board is not competent, then you're not going to get competent management. If the board is politically appointed, mm -hmm. you're going to get political appointees or hirings in the executive management. And then the executive management will hire or promote political people down the line. And that has been one of the major problems of Petrotrain through the years. And that is why the committee that I was a member of on to review the operations of Petrotrain and so on made the very explicit recommendations um, that which we presented to the Prime Minister on the 6th of June this year. Um, and, and then we, there was a meeting that was supposed to be with the, uh, with the Joint Select Committee, sorry, joint, uh, sorry, the Standing Committee on Energy, um, chaired by the Prime Minister. And that, was, that meeting was a farce um, and so on because the, 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 the Standing Committee met and discussed the report and then only two members of the committee were there because um, to, to actually meet with them, we met with them for five minutes, so that meeting mm. was a farce. Um, but what we said is 
that the members of the board of directors are selected through a process which provides for comprehensive and transparent input and feedback from key stakeholders to ensure that members possess the relevant experience and capabilities to address priority matters critical to the transformation and sustainable development of the company. Mm -hmm. And then we also want to say, Petrogen adopts a policy whereby the board of directors' terms of office are cycled in such a manner as to ensure that at all times there's continuity of membership of at least 50% of the board. In other words, you don't have a situation where after every election or every new minister of energy is appointed, you get a new board. Because you can't plan a sustainable right. future with such a short Although cycle. priorities are changed every time you begin to, you, right. you've initiated one. That's right. So mm -hmm. people don't know if they're going left, right, backwards, forwards, and ultimately the company goes backwards. Let me just be so clear that uh, of these two things. So on the one hand, the argument is not the size of the salaries of the people be to, to be of international standard, but first the chicken or the egg. The first thing you're saying is, get me a board that is non-partisan, and then we will worry about who is paid what. Is that it? That is correct. Um, and the sad thing was that the cabinet did not go with this recommendation mm. of the committee. So they appointed a new board without any comprehensive mm. and transparent input and feedback from key stakeholders. Mm. Mm. So you have people there who, I think a former mayor of Arima is on the board, another person who is a political person mm. is on the board and so on. And, and, and also very sad to say that the chairman of the board, Mr. Espiné, was a member of this committee. Mm. Mr. Selwyn Lashley, who is PS, was chairman of the committee. Mm. So members of the committee made recommendations as to how the board should be appointed and then accepted an appointment inconsistent with the recommendations that mm. we made. And then Robert Riley um, was a member of the committee. He's now an advisor to the board, and a board which was not appointed with how it should have been appointed. And then um, Mr. there was a Mr. Myers, who was um, a former PS and so on, who was co-opted to the committee. He also is an advisor. So four people who were members of the committee are now either members of the board or mm. advisors to the board. Staggering. It looked as if people were doing this thing on the committee to create a job for themselves afterwards. I was asked by the Prime Minister to serve on the board, and I turned it down on the principle that the process of appointing the board was inconsistent mm. Mm. with what we had recommended. You sit on a board, and the decision is to take a maxi to Port of Spain, but the people who are on that committee, in fact, own private vehicles, and then they decide to go with the p private vehicles anyway. That's yeah, essentially that's what right, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. 25 minutes after 11 o'clock, staggering as it is. Yeah. Uh, let me turn across to the side of the workers and the union because yeah. um, while it is one thing to look at the managers um, uh, and, and how we are carrying through this very important resource and the revenue thereof uh, to the country, some have posited that compared to oil producers in other countries, Petrotrin used twice or three times the workers for the size and output derived presently. Are yeah. they correct? Yes and no. Um, yes, there, there are international benchmarks which suggest that Petrotrain has more employees than, than other companies with the same output. But then on the other hand, you have a situation where in some areas of Petrotrain, mm. in the technical areas, the company is understaffed so that there are too few refinery mm. operators employed uh, to the point where there is built in over time, which is costing the company huge amounts of money, which the union is against. Um, because you don't have enough operators to run the thing. So it, it means that you have operators having to work um, 16 hours and then come off for eight and then come back on again. You're talking about management of resources then, is that what you're telling me? Yes, and this has been going on not for six months, this has been going on for six years. And mm. more. So that the company has, has no succession planning um, to ensure that when people retire in a large cohort of the workers in Petrotrain, uh, 50 and above, and when they go, there are no requisite um, skill levels to replace them. Mm. So, so we're going to be mm. in serious trouble. So um, there are too many administrative st people. In other words, there are some areas of the company which uh, are not involved in production or in refining, which are large in terms of numbers relative. And therefore, if you, if you need to look, for example, at, at staffing overall, you really need to look at at areas which are not involved directly in production or in refining and so on. Is it, too, is it true to uh, accurate to extrapolate from what you're saying that you concede uh, there is a case of too many workers 
in a general sense, but this can be corrected by, by having them utilize in, 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 in other areas efficiently. Am, well, I, am I well, correct on that? Well, not well, because somebody who is just what, not to pick on a department, I'm not saying that they should go, but just take a uh, pipe man example, may not work some, in somebody who is in, in public relations, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. can't be an operator. Mm -hmm. They don't have the same, the right skills. I'm just trying to follow because yeah. my follow-up question to that is, yeah. you're talking about there is going to be some um, laying off going on if we try to get this efficiently. Now, I'm not saying that this is the first place you go. I, I go along with what you were saying. Let us get the management right. Yeah. Then let us get the... And there are too many managers. Uh -huh. In other words, the company is, is too top-heavy. There are too many layers of decision-making. And because there are too many layers of decision-making, nobody is accountable and responsible. Everybody passes the buck up the line. Whereas people need to take responsibility and accountability for the areas that, that they are in charge of. So we, so need, we need tweaking a, we need and correcting flatter. from all levels. Yes, we need a flatter organizational structure and, and we need one that, um, w and this is what the committee recommended as well, that there be three business units, not three separate companies, but three units which operate um, with full responsibility and accountability enshrined to them. Mm. So that you would have Trinma, because that the, the, the production in offshore is, is, is critical in terms of, of the viability of the company, land exploration and production, and then refining and marketing. Mm. And what we said is therefore that the person who is head of Trinma or the person who is head of land ENT or the, the refining and marketing must be fully accountable for what takes place within their business unit. Put on your political hat here for a minute. You're the leader of the MSJ. Question for you. With all you have seen, because you've been in the oil industry all these years, um, are you optimistic that, in fact, we are going to get uh, resolve that targets the corrective measures suggested? I know you said uh, one such meeting went the wrong way. I understand that. Yeah. But do you think now, because the coffers are not as full, uh, as full as they used to be, uh, there is a reality check on all of the nation. Sure. Do you see a resolve towards correcting this the proper way? Um, Are you encouraged I, by anything you have seen? I, I think attempts are going to be made to correct it, but the attempts that have been made to correct it might not very well be in the right way, in the way that I would like to see it go. Mm. Let me put it that way around. Some mm. people may think it's the right way, so let me let me not be prejudicial on that. Mm -hmm. It's not the way I think it should go. Um, in other words, there's great pressure mm -hmm. to sell, to privatize. That's that's an easy, simple solution and so on. But that is fraught with its mm -hmm. own implications in terms of loss of capacity of the country, loss of revenue on, and, and jobs and a whole set of other things like that. And and really reallocating wealth from from state resources or the state and therefore the people and reallocating that wealth into the hands of a few private people, a foreign company or, or some big local operators. So I don't think that's the way to go. Um, I am not confident that that the transformation generally, not only of Petrotrain, but of the economy that is necessary, the diversification of the economy that is necessary, or the transformation of our institutions of state, mm -hmm. criminal justice system, to deal with not just you know one set of crime, but, but, but all crime, whether it's from murders or white collar crime and so on. Um, the parliament as an institution that, that, that passes um, laws that are really in the interest of people and provides the kind of oversight over the executive that is necessary. Um, the functioning of cabinet and the administration in terms of implementing decisions. I don't think that our institutions of state are, are able to deal with the challenge of Trinidad and Tobago 2017 going forward. I think these institutions are like, mm. uh, like a, a Me Too phone you know, mm -hmm. and you want to load up um, iPhone Mr. Business, West, yes. yes, Mr. Mm -hmm. West fancy apps. Yes. On, on. Yes. It's just not going to work. It just can't work. Well, it's a reality check for all of the nation because from what you're saying, which is what we find now, even when the AG moves to uh, correct a situation, you find that the punishment uh, that's there is is, 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 is is minimal. It's a slap on the wrist. So you have to go back and fix that. We have to rip off a lot of templates and concepts and uh, that, that we have in procedures that we have in place in order to correct these issues. So some upheaval is what we are going to need, but we must yeah. have the, the, the stomach for it. For it, yes. I mean, the system the system is just not working for the majority of people but is it true to say that while the the the, the, the system that oversees the system 
um, <laughs> while, while the system <laughs> needs to get some corrections that we are talking about, unions also have to get um, some correction. Yes, the, I have no doubt that there are some unions that, that need to, to, to rethink mm. their role. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have said, you know, that um, many unions have lost their way. They have focused too narrowly on their members at the workplace. Mm -hmm. Whereas in 1937, yes. it was not a trade union movement. It was a labor movement which embodied and encompassed all working people and people who are not working. Wonderful differentiation, uh, yeah. yes. And focusing not just on industrial relations at the workplace, but on all the social and political and mm -hmm. economic issues of the day. Mm -hmm. The agenda was multifaceted. Yes. And mm -hmm. Sir mm -hmm. Arthur Lewis, he wasn't Sir then, he wasn't a Nobel Prize winner, but wrote mm -hmm. a very important um, pamphlet called Labour in the West Indies for the British Fabian Society in 1938-39, mm -hmm. which was published by New Beacon Books, headed by John LaRose, Trinidadian, and so on, who passed away, and Sarah White. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. with an afterward by Susan Craig, our noted um, Tobagonian sociologist mm -hmm. and historian. And Arthur Lewis said uh, what happened in the 30s was, was, was a revolution because labor had thrust itself into the political arena, yep. encompassing yep. everything in the society. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly trade unions that have moved away from those moorings need to refocus so that they're articulating the problems of, of the poor and powerless generally. We are also going to need more time with you the next time we invite you here. <laughs> well, we uh, got through a lot this morning. Yeah, we really. got through a lot this morning, <laughs> I did. But, From you know, I, I, to I, to I have this insatiable appetite once I, I start getting context. <laughs> I like to just follow <laughs> through know, on it. I know. I <laughs> David know. Abdullah, I uh, leader I of the it. MSJ, man, I appreciate you taking the yeah. time to come down this morning. I appreciate your clarity and your candid approach to it because oftentimes you do not find a disposition to embrace the corrective measures from all sides. Yeah. Uh, everybody's got their agenda, and most folks like to say this is the way. Even when you were talking about your opinion, you said, "Well, that is what I proffer. Yeah, it is not right. what I what, what I you know. It is not the beginning and the end all. Yeah. which means you're not a follower of Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> another, another topic. No, no. <laughs> but 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 that's so serious. And thanks, really, for for that. And um, and you know, there's tre tremendous controversy with his attacks on well, African course, American um, athletes. And he goes so on after Curry. It. Goes after the that's footballer. Right, that's one. right. Yeah, and, and and it, it's the right. language is frightening. Yeah, that's right. Fire that Fire SOB. Them, that's right. Imagine that yeah <sighs> anyways yeah. Uh, but let me just say that you know this republic day one of the messages that and i'm going to have a press conference mm. tomorrow on it is the, the the idea of the second republic because as far as i'm concerned the institutions of this and the system of the first republic have failed and we now need to bring fundamental change for the second republic very big statement <laughs> you made you opened the door to aid another conversation because as long as you accept they say to overcome anything you must accept that there is a problem. Once you accept there is a problem, then you're prepared to confront it, and then you deal with the consequences as unpalatable as they may be sometimes. Makes so. a very good point for that Second Republic. Thank Take you, my brother. Have a Take wonderful care. day.